fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal has seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day -day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong. My grace is sufficient because my strength is made perfect through your weakness. Grace is sufficient for every step of the way. We have been so burdened for almost a year now with consequences from the pandemic. We still carry our masks around. And good news, right? It looks like the numbers are going down, the trends are going down. There's a little bit of a glimpse of hope at the end of the tunnel. We're just hoping it's not a train that is coming our way. So it looks like finally we can see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. We're really hopeful things are gonna start looking better and better. And people are beginning to ask, what is the new normal? As you saw, our governor here in Texas has declared that masks are not a mandate anymore. Out of an abundance of caution and wisdom, we're going to continue to wear our masks here at church as leadership team, in our classrooms, our, our kids, every, every one of our ministries. We want to see how things trend down after, after spring break, but we want to be super careful and we want to be gracious with people as well. If somebody shows up and they don't want to wear their mask, well, we, all, we, we still have a mask-only section, so you can sit there, but we're going to be as gracious, respecting one another uh, and what we're going to do. So people me, so what is the position of church? We're going to be as careful as we can be. We're going to err on the side of caution. But if you show up your, with, without your mask, and you're one of those that is not going to wear a mask, not even if Jesus asks you, that's okay. We still love you, right? We want you to be here. We're going to respect you. Please, if we stay six feet away from you, it's not because we hate you. It's because we are still practicing social distancing practices. We're still sanitizing our hands. We're trying to be as careful as we can be for the sake of those that may have conditions that if they catch something, it doesn't get pretty, right? It's not just an aspirin and it can be really complicated. So we're going to walk the extra mile a little bit longer and see how things go. But we are hopeful that in the midst of all this overwhelming need, with pandemics, with riots, with ice storms, with all sorts of crazy things, His grace is more than enough. He will carry us through. He will continue to, do new, to bring new life. And the beautiful thing about this is that people are beginning to wonder what life after a pandemic is going to be like. People are talking about a next normal or a new normal. So let me ask you this. Do you want to go back to normal? Do you want to go back to the way things were before? The comfort of your travels, not wearing your mask, not worrying about all the social distancing, the hugs. Do you want to go back to normal? There's an author that published an article in one of the newspapers um, not too long ago, and he says this about going back to normal. He says this. I want to share this with you. I thought it was insightful. He says, how did it come to this? A virus a thousand times smaller than a dust mold has humbled and humiliated the planet's most powerful nation. The United States cannot prepare for this inevitable crisis if it returns to normal. As many of its people ache to do, normal led to this. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. The, US, the United States needs to grapple with all the ways normal failed us. Let me ask you this. 
because we live in the greatest nation on the face of the planet, because everything is better in America, because we have reached this life of comfort and affluence and, and, and all the travel and all the military power and might, are we in heaven? We are not there yet, are we? We are not in the kingdom yet. We are caught between the already of Jesus' death and resurrection and the not yet of his second coming. We haven't arrived. There is still plenty of room for us to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And we have a mission. And there is still plenty of people who do not know the Savior, Jesus Christ. There is plenty to do. We haven't arrived. Our normal before the pandemic is not the end product that God wants for his family. In many ways, the normal we used to experience led more and more to a lifestyle of idolatry and immorality. Because with all the affluence, with all the options, with all the money, who needs God? You can be your own God. Why would you need to worship a God if you can be worshiped yourself? Normal is not what God wants for you or for me. Normal, by definition, dictionary, is a pattern of behavior that you can expect. It's something predictable. God doesn't want to be tamed and put in a little box. God wants to still be God because he's God. And he wants to show up with his people telling us that normal in a godless culture is not what God wants for us or anybody else. He, want to be, he wants to be the center of our lives. So normal, in many ways, with all the comfort of modern life, has failed us. And I'll tell you why. Because normal does not have the answer to the ultimate questions. Who am I? What am I here for? What about death? With all the technology, such a little thing, a virus, can bring us to our knees, right? That's a reminder that our life is in the hand of God. It is in the hand of God. So normal is not good enough. But there's a new normal for the people of God. There's a, there's a, there's a sense of stability. There's a sense of predictability that comes from knowing Almighty God. And that predictability is not boredom because God wants to surprise us and he wants to, he wants to act in our lives in ways that we cannot possibly anticipate. But he wants to give us stability so that we don't have to worry about tomorrow. Every day has enough evil of its own. If you trust in God, the God of the Bible is a God way bigger than this world that is able to provide for you even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of the direst needs. It's not like this is the first time that a pandemic has hit the church, right? The church has grown through up and downs. Empires have risen and fallen. Kings have come and gone. And the church of Jesus Christ remains to the day because we have a loving, living Savior. Amen. So... As you heard in the baptisms, Jesus is still changing our lives, our children, our young, our adults. It's never too late for Jesus to give us not the old normal, but the new normal of his kingdom, the newness of life in Jesus Christ. So what is this normal all about? Well, his article, How the Pandemic Defeated America, is entitled that, and he says, a virus has brought the world's most powerful country to his knees. So let me ask you this. Are we on our knees yet? You get me? Come on, brother George, you told me a couple of things last week, right? You get me, people? Are we on our knees yet? Are we coming in humility before Almighty God saying, God, I have been living my life as if your absence is normal and that is not okay? Today, I recognize that if anybody has a plan, that is you. I need you. I need a new normal. I need a new way of living that doesn't look into my resources, doesn't look into the government, doesn't look into the United Nations simply to give me a sense of stability. Don't look around. Down here, there is nothing but death, but death on our own resources. Look up. If you are on your knees, you can begin to look up. Many of us have been brought to our needs, but we're still not looking up. God wants you to look up. God wants you to look up to give you a new sense of normalcy. You know why? Because this pandemic, this space of this search for new normalcy, is really about asking this question, who is in control of our stories? When all the stories around us seem to be out of control, who is in control of our stories? You can choose to be controlled by the news. You can choose to be controlled by the media, by politicians. And then you can see just the trends of social media, right? Lines after lines of bitter comments and fighting and everybody. Guys, 
Somebody told me the other day, we have stopped talking to each other face to face and we just talk about each other. We don't communicate face to face. We don't respect each other enough to have a face to face conversation the way Jesus commanded in Matthew 18. We just tweet, right? You know what tweet is? He's just the electronic backstabbing of gossip. That's all it is. And now our politicians are driven by it. Our celebrities are driven by it because everybody tweets, right? Everybody gabs. But that doesn't mean that that's what we should do. James clearly spoke about how the tongue is a fire, a destructive world. But you have to decide who will control your story. If the media sets the narrative for the meaning of your life, then you and I have nothing to experience but anxiety and worry. That's what's waiting for you. And guess what? There is more of that. More of the same. And it's nothing new in Rome. They have their newspapers. They had the graffiti, right? They invented all that. All the news, they had their Twitters on the walls. A scandalous narratives that controlled people's lives. Our world is out of control because we have refused the control of the only one who can give us a real government, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this whole narrative, amen, is about choosing what will control your story. You need to decide who will lead you in this journey. The good news is this. Our God has a plan. And God is already ahead of the game. So what I would like to, with us in the next few weeks, church family, is coming back now, hopefully, and Lord willing, that the pandemic numbers are going down. We're beginning to get our economy is opening. We're trying to get a sense of predictability. And even for church, how are we going to come back with our programming, right? Are we going to have this? Are we going to have that? I don't want to tell you what we're going to have because what we're going to have is not about what we want to have. We have to ask the question, not what, what, what is it that we want, but what is it that you, Lord, want? Our church needs to be fiercely intentional and driven by what God wants, not by what religious customers want. We want to be people that pleases the Lord. So I've been scrambling and praying and thinking, Lord, how do we prepare for this? How do we prepare for a period in our history where we're coming back after an event that will mark our generation? How many of you remember 9-11? You remember where you were, right? You remember the chaos of that period and the turmoil and the economic downfall and the war on terror and everything that unfolded from there. We have kids and teenagers that weren't born yet. But I'll tell you what they will remember. They'll remember the pandemic. They'll remember the mass. They'll remember the Zooming. They'll remember school online only. They'll remember the trauma of this season. This is not the first time that we have gone through things like this. Every generation has defining moments that will mark their minds about the future and color the way we see reality. The same thing is true about the Bible, about the people of God, the people of Israel. So I was praying, where are we going to go to get direction for the next, the new normal that we need? You know, the people of Israel were given the promised land so they could become a nation that worshiped the Lord. And through them, they would be a kingdom of priests. Through them, all the nations would be able to come and know God. Israel, because of their abundance, because of their blessing, remember Solomon? He had gold like rocks on the city and silver like rocks. He was so wealthy, his wealth and the power of his kingdom corrupted him. And they became an idolatrous and immoral nation. When you and I forget the giver of the gifts and make the gifts an idol, we just don't go downhill, right? So that happened to Israel. God sent his prophets to tell them, repent, repent, come back to me. People gave their backs to God and turned more and more immoral and idolatrous. And you know what happened? God punished the people of Israel and purified them through a process called the exile. After sending all the prophets and after Israel rejected God, God said, I'm going to use the nations to punish you. But not only that, I'm going to refine you. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to restore you and I'm going to rebuild your testimony for you learning that if you don't want to learn by instruction, you will learn by correction. It's kind of like us as little kids, right? There are two ways of learning. You can learn by instruction, which is God's favorite way of teaching. Obey me and live. That's God's favorite way of teaching. He wants to give you life up front. But if you disobey, if you're rebellious, the wages of sin is death. And then, because God loves you so much, he still corrects you so that you don't experience the full brunt of sin. That's still mercy. His correction is merciful because he wants you to come back to the right way. Well, that's what happened to Israel. God used the nations to come and take Israel away from the promised land in a process of exile that for the, the, the kingdom of Judah lasted 70 years. About... about um, 
the year 586, 587, King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, an emerging superpower that was conquering the whole world, came, conquered Jerusalem, and took all the Jewish people away to a foreign land where they, where they would have to serve the pagan gods. So they would learn that it wasn't as glamorous as they thought it was. It was going to be a time of suffering. But after 70 years, as we will, as we will see, God brought them back and restored them in a series of three different events. If you have your QR code out there and you see our newsletter, there's a video I want you to watch. It's from the Bible Project. It summarizes in eight minutes about 100 years of history. It's priceless. It's right there for you to watch. But there are three different waves of people that come back to the Promised Land. There is Zerubbabel, there is Ezra, and there is Nehemiah. And why am I telling you all this? Because, guys, what God has done in the past... He'll do it again and again and again. And he's doing it with us. And what did he do? Through Zerubbabel, which by the way, if you read Matthew chapter 1, Zerubbabel is the great, 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 great grandpa of none other than the king, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God uses one of Jesus' ancestors, a descendant of David, to come back from the captivity, the faithfulness of God's promises, preserving the Davidic line to bring Messiah later on. And he called him to rebuild the temple. And then as he brings Ezra, Ezra comes to restore obedience to the law of God, the word of God. And then when he brings Nehemiah, he comes to rebuild the city to be a light to the nations. What is this all about? Worship, the temple, God living in our center, discipleship, and mission. You may be wondering, we have a clear mission. We have our values. What's the plan? How are we going to multiply disciple makers, invite all people to join you and all the rest, right? How are we going to do this? The same way God has always done. By creating a community of people who are so obsessed about living in the presence of God that they become obedient to Him. And out of their obedience, that life spills over the nations and other people that live godless lives look for a new normal and new stability that only can come from God. That's mission. Would you like to look at God's plan? So come with me. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, one of the passages that speaks about this plan. Before they went into exile, actually, they had already kind of gone into exile, some of them in different waves. Jeremiah sends a letter to them in exile saying, guys, even though this has been so difficult and so traumatic, God has a plan and God hasn't been caught by surprise. Look up. God is going to tell you what his plan is. So Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1 to 14, tells us what the plan was for the people of Israel in this period of cap captivity. Now, mind you, this is what God told the people of Israel. The church is not the people of Israel. We're living many, many thousand years later. But the lessons that we're going to learn from the way in which God prepared his people can be still applicable for us believers, New Testament believers, because we can learn from the character of God. And we can learn how God has taken his people through very difficult situations before. And hear me out. Prepare for what is coming. You may think the pandemic was bad, right? It's nothing compared with the tribulation the world will experience when Jesus is done with his mission. And before suffering, God always prepares his people so that we can be a witness, and, but also gives a warning to the world because when God announces judgment, judgment is the last thing that God wants to do. When your mama yells your name and you don't listen, you have a, a couple of seconds, right? But if, he, if she yells your name and your middle name, Miguel Angel Lopez, you can hear the clinging of the bells, right? And that's not good. When God announces judgment, judgment is the last thing that God wants to do, but he's ready to act. You don't want to wait because when his grace ends, his justice comes, and his justice is devastating. So Jeremiah writes this letter to the captives and tells them, guys, it's going to be a bumpy ride, but God has a plan. So come with me. Jeremiah 29, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 9 first, and we will see what God's plan is in the midst of a world out of control. How do we get this kind of stability in an out of control world? So it says, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people from Neb whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This, is, this was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elassah, the son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. 
plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. So how does God prepare us to have stability in a chaotic world when everything in our lives goes around against us? First, God prepares us to win in the long run. There's no easy solution here for a problem of sin, friends. Great to have the vaccines, right? That's going to help us with our health. It's not going to fix our sin. It's not going to fix the brokenness of our world. There will be other pandemics. There will be other economic downturns. Nations will rise and fall until Jesus comes to bring the kingdom. So we'd better prepare. To the people of Israel, he told them, I, this is what I want from you guys. I want you to live lives that prosper. In the midst of your affliction, I want you to be the best businessmen, the best families, the best people that dwell in the land so that you can be a witness to other people and bring one thing, shalom, peace, prosperity. I want you to be people that in the midst of a chaotic world, you're an island of God's presence. Wherever your foot lands, I want you to represent me so that the pagan people may see that living for me is good. And you know what? That's exactly what the New Testament tells us. Paul in the letters tells us, guys, you ought to be living good lives. Peter himself also tells us, live a good life among the Gentiles so that when they are cursing you and slandering you, when God comes, they will see that that was their problem. You guys ought to be people that prosper, and not only that, that seek the prosperity of the community where God has planted you. You know why? Because we're here for the long run. We are here to be a blessing because when the kingdom comes, people will know that there was a prophet among us. We are that prophetic voice of God, just as the people of Israel was called to be. Prosper. Live a good life. But not only that, God says, there will be a lot of competing narratives clamoring for your attention. There will be false prophets that will tell you, if you do this, this. Don't listen to them. Listen to what I have already told you. Pay attention to your Bible. Even in the Bible, you have different prophetic voices, right? You have people who are slapping Jeremiah on the cheek, and Jeremiah says, we'll see which one is fulfilled, right? You said there will be prosperity. God is bringing Nebuchadnezzar. Let's Let's see who's on the right side. You need to be a person that is on God's side. Because if you are not grounded in the trust of the Word of God, you're going to be an easy prey. You're going to be like a sheep that is just tossed to and fro in the waves. You need some roots. You need an anchor based on the faithfulness of God. He says right there, don't be distracted by Facebook. Don't be distracted by Twitter. Don't be distracted by this or that political party. Your hope is not in the red or in the blue. You don't follow a donkey, and you don't follow an elephant. Who do you follow? You follow the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, everything else has to be weighed against it. Do not embrace anything defining your identity but what Jesus Christ has said. That's what God told the exiles. You're going to be my people. Therefore, cling to my word. You're here to win in the long run. Have you read your whole Bible cover to cover? If not, you're missing. You're missing so much. You know why? Because we already know how the battle ends. And we know who wins. We know who wins. Jesus Christ wins and he brings his kingdom. You don't want to miss that. If you're so busy by somebody that was born four years ago that has billions of dollars and he's so proud because he has the world on his palms, this guy, nobody's going to remember whoever this guy is. Nobody's going to remember who he is in 200 years if Jesus takes that long in coming back. When was the last time you were worried about Constantine the Great? (laughs) He came and went, right? Thousands of years ago, one of the most powerful men in history. He's gone. Nobody cares. Unless you are in Jesus Christ, nobody will ever care. So, play for the long run, win in the long run. But there's one more thing. And this verse is so popular, has been used so many times. Look at what it says in verse 11 through 14. It says, well, verse 10 says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. <laughs> Does God have a plan? To the T. 
He says, says, in 70 years, and we don't have time to unpack this, but we will unpack more as we go. It's super exciting. There's a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, the prophecy of the 70 weeks, where God shares with Daniel his plan for the ages, rebuilding of the city, the coming of Messiah, even the future that we're still living. So exciting. He moves the curtain of eternity and says, this is what's going to happen. Israel, pay attention to your next move. In 70 years, can we make it 69? No, do not negotiate with God. He's going to do it in his own good, good timing. So just do what God has called you to do. He has a plan. So in 70 years, what's going to happen? I will bring you back. I'll fulfill my promise. Verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to, for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place for, from which I sent you into exile. God fulfilled this promise to the T when in 537... A decree of one of the Median and Pers Persian kings sent the people of Israel back to rebuild this future and this plan. But here's the beautiful thing about God's plan. God wants to provide a vision of hope for his people in the midst of a chaotic world. God wants to provide a vision of hope. And what is that vision of hope? That God is in control. And he has a plan. And his plan is good for you, for me, for our families, for this world. And how do I access that plan? How do I join him in his plan? You see? Just as God told the people of Israel, he said, the exile is going to have an effect on you. Now, I begged you before. I have begged you for so long, but you rejected me. In one of the prophets, he said, two sins my people committed. They left me a fountain of living waters, and they dug for themselves empty pit without water. You left me, but there will be a time when your need will force you to be on your knees and look up and seek me. And seek me with all of your heart. So this first time of the pro this first part of the process of the new normal is this. You and I need to return to God. The Bible calls that repentance. Every one of us has idols in our hearts that we have been bowing to. Whether it's binging for Netflix, eh? I'm in, among the sinners, right? Binging for Netflix or your Hulus or your whatever it is. Guys, there are people who pay hundreds of dollars to go on a, on a Cowboys game, right? And they're yelling. I love our students today. Couldn't we be a little bit excited about baptisms? Every single Sunday we sing to the king of the universe. Oh, yeah, yeah. That song doesn't connect to me. I don't care that song connecting with you. I care, that, I care that you and I connect with the living God. Are you connecting with him? Because your words matter to him. We need to be a church that comes back to God and seek him, just like the people of Israel, with all of our hearts. Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. Those who ask will receive. Those who knock will get an answer, and the door will be open. And when the door opens, you know what God says? God says this, welcome home. God says this, welcome because I want to be your new normal. And that's what worship is all about. So, as we go, welcome to your new normal. To acknowledge God's plan in our lives means realizing that history is actually his story. Your story is, is not, not your own. own. Yeah. Who controls your narrative? If it is not God, then it's nobody else. Let me close with this church family. Celebrated 19 baptisms, right? There's more to celebrate. Let me show you. Victoria Buckingham, are you here? Can you stand up? There's Victoria. Awesome. Tyler, Brandy, Lauren, Claire, Julian, Elliot, Audrey, Violet, and Melina Berkey. Are you guys here? They may be here. Where are you? Loud and clear up there. Large family, the Berkeys. Welcome, friends. Very nice. Catalina Carrera is here. Oh, no, she's in her Spanish service. She's not here, but she's coming. She'll be here shortly. Maybe she's waiting for you to get out so she can come in and worship, right? No, no, no. Rafael Cruzado, too. Same thing. Blake, Mary, Isaiah, Ruth, Malachi Flickner. Are you guys here? Where are you? 
Up there also, guys, so glad you're here. Guadalupe Garza, she comes to our Spanish service, growing. Ventura Gonzalez, Ventura helps with our technicians in the Spanish service too. Cody Hamilton, Cody, are you here in our college group? Cody, 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 maybe somewhere, maybe Cody's not here today. Okay, very good. Cody, um, Catiusca Perez, Spanish service also, Solo Mendoza. Daniel Rios, Daniel, are you here? Daniel, you're right there with Victoria. Daniel, awesome. Bienvenido, Daniel. We speak Spanish, so. Very nice. Daniel. Diego, Tania, Camila, Sofia, and Paloma Torres, they go to Spanish service. And that's it. Did you count the names? 30 people. These are our new members in our family, guys, in the last couple of months. 30 new members in our church family that have said, I want to join the journey. You see, that's what the new normal is all about. Just as we celebrate it today, when God is present in our fellowship, people are drawn to him, not just because we're so cute, which we are. <laughs> really, really, it's because he's beautiful beyond comparison. And we are going to go tell people. We're not going to wait for them just to come. If they come, we'll welcome them. But we're going to go get them. That needs to be our new normal. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this morning. We are so rich. We are so rich in having you as our God and Savior. You have a plan, Lord. You have a plan that gives us stability, that gives us hope, that gives us a vision of hope for the future. And our story is your story. We want it to be, Lord. So I pray that our new normal will not be controlled by the despair, the worries, the fighting of this world. I pray that it will be controlled by a relentless vision of the power of the gospel to bring this dying world into the beauty of your life eternal. That the kingdom will come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven through our lives. Make us, Lord, people of blessing to our community, people who seek their peace, their shalom, their prosperity, as we tell them of who you are, Lord Jesus, just like Israel did. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, and even better, because wherever Israel failed, wherever we fail, Lord Jesus, you succeed. You are the one we point to, and you're the one we worship. Your name we pray. Amen.